Welcome, everybody, to the Late, Late, Late Show. Uh, my name is Bill Dinger. I am a solutions architect with VML. We're a digital ad agency based out of the uh, United States and Missouri. Although we have offices all around the world, including Warsaw and, and Krakow. Um, I'm here, dear, talk, here today to talk to you about unit testing strategies and patterns in C Sharp. Um, right there at the bottom is the link to the GitHub, which has all the code I'm going to show, hopefully all the code, um, depending on time constraints, as well as the link to the slides, which I also believe the conference organizers are going to post as well for us after the conference. But just in case, you can grab it there, GitHub. Um, real quick, before I go into it, raise a hand. How many people use unit testing in their day-to-day -day developer lives? Okay, that's actually really good. Like two years ago, that was about a third of that people. I mean, now I, I, about 70% of you. Um, so we're gonna go, I will skip, we're kind of pressed for time. Usually, you know, 45 minutes and um, usually takes about an hour. So I'll skip a bit of the salesman pitch on, um, on why to use unit testing. But just FYI, like I said, I, I, my day to day is, is working with developers. Uh, right now I, I do a lot of um, the number of the, big four telecom in the United States. And, um, you know, we have a hundred plus developers working on a project. We started enforcing unit testing a couple years ago, just because it became insanity to try to manage bugs. And after doing that and, and building that code and, and working, um, this is the, the tips and tricks I've learned over the years. And I've carried over now, you know, I, I do the same type of stuff in, in Java in TypeScript and JavaScript, uh, but we're gonna be C sharp focused today. So first off, let's level set like, Tuesday night, I was having a fight with other um, delightful speakers about unit testing the definition of. So let's go ahead and set the definition to start with, right? So what I mean by unit test is a test written by a developer for a developer, quoting the uh, Emily quote by Bob Martin. Um, it is really just designed to make sure the program does what it wants to do. And, and that's it. It's for the developers. It's not necessarily for QA or your boss or the BSA or, or, or PM or anybody else, just for the devs. There's other types of testings. For the purpose of us, we don't care about these. You know, there's integration tests, there's acceptance testing, there's system testing, there's UI tests, there's, there's a ton, right? For us, we're just, I'm really speaking to developers. This is to help us out. So here's my goals and here's what I wanna show. And this is really what I'm, what I'm looking for here, guys. Um, for one, by the way, everybody can see that, right? It's nice being this gigantic movie screen. I think everybody can see, uh, I love it. So first thing, we wanna make sure the code does what it's supposed to do. We want to reduce the brittleness of the code. Um, obviously, one of the big things you can have happen in, in projects is somebody changed something and oops, now everything broke in prod, right? Unit tests help prevent that. Um, produce well-written productive code. Uh, one of the things I've noticed as I switched to TDD and hopefully the rest of you have as well is that uh, as people learn to write tests, almost inevitably they write better code. Just they learn more about how the code is structured and how it flows and it reads and written better. Um, enable test-driven development. This talk isn't about TDD but unit testing does enable TDD. And my favorite and the one where I started doing this is enable rapid developer feedback loops. You don't have to wait for the entire application to start. So how many of you work on projects that take 30 seconds to a minute to start up before you can start attaching and debugging? Anybody? Couple hands. So I originally started really going deep in this because the app I was working on took about seven minutes to start up. Um, it was a terrible CMS and terrible CMSs are terrible CMSs. So yeah, and, and even now, some of the uh, Dockerized ASP.NET Core stuff I have still takes you know five to 10 seconds, which doesn't seem like a lot, except when you're a developer and it's 5.30 PM and you're trying to get a bug so you can go home. Um, so a lot of these tricks, tips and tricks are about, let's get code written testable and let's do it in like those things are saying two, three, five milliseconds constantly. Um, so as part of that, our unit tests to make them successful so that we can achieve these goals, then to be fast, right? We should be making database calls. We should be calling HTTP endpoints. Um, they should be pass or fail. That's it. Never inconclusive. That binary states. Um, repeatable. I should be able to run a test one time or 500 billion times and should always do the same state. Order independent, test should be able to run in any order at any time. Um, easy to set up, you know, they should be testing a small piece of functionality. And finally, and the most controversial, um, you can start a million fights on the internet about this, uh, you should test public interfaces only. Um, we can fight about it later, come down, it's fine. All right, so let's talk about what is a unit we'll be talking about here. So usually you start this, this is how I start, right? So when I, when I form projects and teams and when I bring everybody in, it's like, all right, guys, let's define what a, what a unit is. Um, 
So it's a group defines it. For me, usually on most of my projects, it is gonna be a method. Some people define the unit of work we're testing as to be a class. Um, other people go even farther than that, but um, it's done by convention. In all the examples, like I said, it's, it's a test of a single method and they're grouped by class. Um, so the demo project and the rest of these things I'm gonna show you here, it's a bike shop API. I know I'm a fat American, but I do like riding bicycles. I write quite a bit of them. It's just American food causes this. Uh, so it's a bike shop web API. Um, it's built on REST calls. It's got some, some kind of arbitrary stuff. There are two branches in the code repo that I'll push out. One is ASP.NET Core. The other one's classic uh, 4.6.NET framework. Um, we're gonna go over the 4.6 stuff because ASP.NET Core is newer and it's actually easier to test. Um, quite a good, I'll point out the differences here as we flip through the slides. So basic testing pattern you're gonna see, and I stole this from um, one of the Scots, uh, Scott Guthrie or Scott Hanselman. Um, arrange, act, assert. Basically, this is how you structure your tests. So in all my code, both production and the demo, you're gonna see in every language, JavaScript, TypeScript, C-sharp, whatever, you're gonna see the same pattern. I'm gonna arrange stuff, I'm gonna make it explicit, I'm gonna do my thing, I'm gonna act system under test, sut, and then I'm gonna wait for a result, okay? If you keep the structure, any arbitrary team member can come in, take a look at your test, and be like, oh yeah, it, it's, I know exactly what's going on here. And also note in all these, we're only checking one thing and exercising one system under test. Um, a range phase, you know, this is where we specify all the preconditions of our test. This very basic example just means I'm setting up some integers, right? Um, and creating a new, new class. Um, act, this is when we actually execute um, it's calling exercising your SUT is always system under test. It's a convention you'll see a lot in literature about unit testing. Uh, this is when we actually execute and run and exercise our system under test. And last, we have the assert. We're just making sure that the result is what we expect it to be. Okay, Those are the building blocks we need for our unit tests. Um, so my favorite joke, there are only two hard problems in computer science. Uh, naming conventions, cache consistency, and off by one errors. Uh, you will probably lose weeks of productivity to this, um, if I had to guess. But for naming convention of your unit test, just fight it out over like a scrum or something, and then just pick something. Uh, all these tests are, are named by uh, method underscore the parameters underscore the result. But you can use whatever. I'm not trying to say it's the best. I'm, just, I'm too old to care about naming conventions anymore. Except for Hungarian notation. You're wrong. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about the hard stuff, right? Um, that was kind of the basics. So again, I was trying to go fast just so we can get into the real meat of this. Like most of the audience here has used testing before. So building for unit testing, um, you have to completely, most of how you build for applications if you're not unit testing is, is very different. Um, when we build for unit testing, we usually want to follow most, if not all of these principles. This isn't a solid talk. If you don't know what solid is, I'd encourage you to check it out. Yeah, in the slides, there's a bunch of resources linking to good plural site authors and, and resources on exactly what solid is. But it's a way of building code so it, it, it is designed to be testable and easily maintainable and less brittle. Although, again, people would fight over me about all three of those things, but they're wrong. No. Uh, so let's skip over most of these. The only thing I want to really talk about, the, the two things we really focus on the most here when it comes to unit testing is the S there, single responsibility principle. Um, most of what you're doing, the methods or classes, or whatever, they, they should only do one thing. I mean, how many times have we seen, I, I literally was just reviewing a PR about an hour ago where somebody put 500 things in a constructor and it was building like a complex object graph and you know, it was just called init. Like that's, that's not doing one thing, that's doing 500 things. Um, that type of stuff is extremely difficult to test if not impossible. The other big thing is um, that, that really helps is the dependency inversion, not dependency injection principle which is basically saying you should depend on abstractions, right? You see in the .NET framework all the time. Um, if I'm running like in .NET Core, if I'm running a web server, I don't know I'm running on Kestrel. I know I'm running on I HTTP server, whatever the heck the interface, or I server, I think it's the interface name, right? You, your lower level abstractions just depend on the, or lower level interface just depend on the abstractions and higher level just give out abstractions. So those two things help the most because otherwise you start having hard coded dependencies and it's a pain in the, Pain everything. So first tip, I would say almost a prerequisite. And nowadays with .NET, it's built in the framework, so it's a lot easier to talk about than it was a couple years ago. Uh, use dependency injection. 
Uh, this is a prerequisite as far as I'm concerned for pretty much any hardcore unit testing beyond the very basics or if using a dynamically typed language. Um, new is your enemy. Whenever you new something up and you're typing new in, you are taking a hard dependency on that object or class. Um, because of this, you have to use, you want to use unit depend, uh, dependency injection to give your classes everything they need in the constructor. So if I, here's a good example, this is my carts controller from that demo service here. Um, you can see I'm injecting in abstractions, interfaces, into my constructor. I don't know what a commerce service actually is. I don't know if it's a, it, I don't know what class implements it. I don't even know if it's a real class or a mock. It, it doesn't matter. Um, as far as this class is concerned, all it cares about is the interface. It doesn't care about the implementation. And that's at a very high level, all dependency injection is. You are supplying a class with its dependencies. It doesn't have to know about them. On the other hand, if I would have done something in here, like do a new logger or something like that, then the class would have to know about the logger and I would be, um, it'd have to know exactly the implementation of the logger and I wouldn't be able to mock it. And we'll get into mocking here in just one second. Uh, building tip number two, again, rely on abstractions. Hopefully everybody has, has kind of gotten on this. Uh, Microsoft themselves have made it pretty obvious in the framework now, especially with .NET Core. Uh, you want to rely on uh, interfaces, or if you can't use interfaces, or you're doing a lot of OOP stuff, you want to rely on abstractions. Um, you do not want to inject like the actual concrete implementation of that. The reason is, you know, .NET is a strongly typed language. We uh, <laughs> have gotten spoiled the last like six months. We're doing a lot of TypeScript and JavaScript work. Um, we can't just fake any random arbitrary object, right? The compiler, for me to supply a mock to this, to let me test it, I have to give it um, something. And if I have a hard-coded class, I can't just arbitrarily swap out that class with a mock implementation. And abstraction on their hand, I can supply any class that implements those interfaces, which lets me mock the behavior. So what that lets me do here in this particular case, right, is I only have to test my, test my products controller. What I don't have to test is my product service or my logger. For those, and we'll show in a second, all I'm doing is giving them um, abstractions and mocked interfaces because I don't care about them for the purposes of my unit test. It is build the developer at 525 on a Friday. All I want to test is my product controller and makes it return the, the methods work how I wrote them. That's it. Okay. Um, other tip, avoid static classes. Uh, Microsoft was really bad about this and, and still is in, in old parts of the framework. Um, static classes can be mocked but they are a huge pain. You actually have to use fakes and shims and, and it's a real, real hassle. Um, so instead, um, instead you should always, always, always avoid the use of them with extremely rare exceptions. Uh, Microsoft, everybody uses, remembers the old HTTP context. Like that guy used to be a big static class. It was nearly impossible. You couldn't mock it. Um, Microsoft got away from themselves. Now it raises abstractions passed around and you should do the same in your own code. Again, these, these can't be mocked. You were gonna, if you had um, that cache class up there in the top left, guys, and you were trying to test it somewhere else, you're gonna to have to make sure that cache class works as well because you can't supply an abstraction. You're gonna be testing it as part of everything else, which just makes your test all the more brittle and all the more harder to do. Uh, the tip here and the, the pattern to use here is create what's called an adapter class. Um, this, it, it looks silly and it arguably is silly, but it lets you test the class. So if you ever run into these and there are a handful, or again, if you're using older .NET code, you're probably gonna have quite a few of these. Um, what you do is you create an interface like you would anything else, and then you create an adapter class. All the adapter class does is shim, just add some wrapper methods around the static methods. Um, the reason you do that though is then you inject in the dependency injection, you inject in that cache class, and you can mock it all you want. You don't have to care about that static class. And at runtime, that's an extremely minimal overhead. I mean, you're just adding one more method call in the stack. It's, it's very, I mean, nanoseconds. So it's a minor performance impact and it lets you mock that those static classes. Um, build tip number four, make smaller methods. Um, the reigning champion that I've seen for the longest method. So I used to work for the state of Nebraska. It's a state in the very, very middle of the United States. The largest method I've ever seen in real, and if anyone can beat this, I feel really sorry for you. But uh, I saw 15,000 lines of code in a single method. It had 29 nested if blocks. That took me like three hours to count, by the way, because it's 15,000 lines of code and that's not, like Visual Studio couldn't handle it. Like it would kept crack and it was awful. Um, so and obviously testing that code and actually working on that code is soul sucking and impossible. So 
What does that tell us? Um, obviously, don't write that many classes. But in general, the smaller your methods are, the easier they are to test. Um, there's a lot of good advice on these. There's a lot of good books, clean code, and all the rest. But um, you know, my personal thing is if it if a function or method is doing more than like um, three or four things, they usually start to refactor it. So again, Bob Martin, clean code says you know they should be small. He thinks it should be less than a hundred lines long. I think there's there's cases where that can be the case uh, different. Like if you're configuring running fluent configuration of a database or something like that, and those can stretch pretty big. All right, again, single responsibility principle, right? Our classes should only do one thing. They shouldn't do 500 things. All right, let's talk about the cool stuff. So here's what I'm gonna use. This is what all the stuff in this demo is. Um, I'm using MS Test. There's a lot of test frameworks out there. They're all great, um, but MS Test just works all the time. And nowadays, Microsoft's put some engineering effort into it and, and borrowed some features from uh, XUnit and some of the other frameworks. Um, so anyway, MS Test comes, it's free with every single edition of Visual Studio, and you all have access to it. And it's because it's built in the Visual Studio, it's basically guaranteed to work. Um, we're using AutoFixture um, as our mocking container. We'll go into what exactly AutoFixture is here in a little bit. And finally, we're using a library called Mock. There are alternatives to all these except for AutoFixture. Um, these are just probably the most common ones and the ones I've used the most. So let's talk about MS Test. So uh, out of curiosity, how many people use MS Test? I got a handful of hands, okay. So a lot of these attributes are probably very similar if you're using something like XUnit or all the rest. Um, they, the terminology is a teeny bit different, but they're all, they all at the, lo at the low, low level rely on the same framework, the Microsoft uh, testing framework. Um, so they're all pretty much the same, just a little bit better features on some of them. So we have different attributes, right? We have test class where we, we put an attribute on a class that lets us mark so the Microsoft test runner knows that that's, that's what we run as a test. We have test methods. We have some attributes here called, you know, test cleanup and test initialize. I mean, all those let us do guys is just set up our prerequisites and mark various methods in the class for running for, for our unit. So I'm gonna flip over, well, let's see if this works okay. I'm gonna flip over to our test solution here. I'll turn up the resolution here. Also, I can't believe that just worked without any hassle. So I, I have this um, bad luck streak going with this laptop. The last four conferences is blue screen during at least one of my presentations and it hasn't done it yet so far. So come on, Dell. Um, let's see if it lasts. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. All right, so let's, let me show you the, uh, show you the very basic class. This is a, obviously a, a mock thing. This is just a, I call it the test adder. All it is isn't is in a addition class. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay, it's at 150%. We go in the back. So again, if you've seen MS test, you actually know all these to be pretty familiar. We put some attributes at the top. Um, those attributes just let the test framework runner know that when we run this guy, it, it is good to go. It is, a it is a unit test that it can reflect on. Then we add some attributes here called test initialize. And all those guys do is set up the test. And then we have various test methods that just mark these as tests. And all that does is, if you're, you should be familiar with this if you're using a test framework, is that when I hit run all, that's the, those are the attributes my, the testing framework uses to determine what a test is, where it's located, and to run it. Yeah. By the way, when I was talking about running fast, I mean, you can see there's 62, but this, this project does have 97% code coverage. But uh, I mean, that, that does a whole lot. But uh, I, I do have, anyway, uh, it only takes about 100 milliseconds, right? The build takes way longer than the test do to run. So this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about these various methods. All right, let's go and start. Okay. Don't blue screen. Yes. Keep the streak alive. All right, here's my test. Uh, here's my tips, again, just from you know, running this over time. Um, again, you know, it's, it's a project. You, you can just add it as part of the interface or um, create a custom. Um, use a test explorer to run your tests and all the rest. Um, I usually create a test project for every project my solution. Um, this can get out of hand if you're, my, I don't know I don't know where this disease got came from, but like I see solutions out there with 100 plus projects that just destroy Visual Studio. So in those odd solutions, maybe you don't want to create another hundred test projects, but hopefully that hasn't happened to you and uh, you're able to just do a test. I just do a single test project for each project I have. I said, hopefully. I had a coworker, he, he did that. He broke out, he, just, he was so proud of himself. He had like 120 solutions. And I'm like, Ben, I can't open this on this computer. Like it just kills it. And we had to change that. Um, anyway, 
So Test Explorer, you know, some ba basic stuff. So this is, Test Explorer is built on Visual Studio. So if you're using XUnit or MS Test or any of the rest, this all works the same. You know, it lets us run tests individually, combination of tests, failing tests, et cetera, et cetera. This is common all of test frameworks, but it lets us just pick isolated parts of the code we want to run. Uh, code cover highlighting. So uh, ReSharper uh, or JetBrains, they put out a way better version of this tool, but it is not free. However, in Visual Studio, there is a free version of this tool. Um, it's buried in code coverage results window at the very bottom of the thing. But if you uh, click that little box right there, it'll start highlighting your code with what is considered covered, okay? Quick thing on coverage, which there's been a couple good medium posts on this recently. Uh, code coverage just means a test has hit that line of code. Doesn't necessarily mean the test is you know, exercising everything or, or even very valid, but it will tell you and show you at least where tests are hitting, okay? And again, Re Visual, uh, ReSharper and JetBrains puts out a, a kind of better version of this, but this is free and baked into the edition. At least as, as 2017. I think in 2013, you might have to have like the ultimate or something like that. Um, so there's also all the asserts. Uh, this is usually the differentiator between MS test and XUnit is there's better asserts in XUnit, I think. We have all sorts of different ways of asserting that our code works correctly, right? I have everything from, I can just do a simple true comparison. I can compare collections. I can wait for exceptions to be thrown. Um, all just designed to make sure our unit tests are returning the correct behavior that I expect. So live unit testing. This is by far my favorite feature of Visual Studio. Because it's that, it's only available in Enterprise Edition. But I'll show you why it's so cool. So live unit testing was added, like I said, in 2017. And it lets you, assuming your machine can handle it, uh, it lets you run. Let's start. Okay. So while this starts up, what it lets you do is it's going to run in the background. It's going to run a comp compile and just start running the solution. As I modify code, it's going to dynamically detect what uh, unit tests are checking that part of code and run them against as as I type. So completely in the background. I mean, my fans are going to kick on, but as I start working and changing the solution, it's constantly validating what I'm doing. So it is running right now. So I'm just gonna gonna break this guy. And let's see if it kills itself. Come on. So you can see it adds some little like, yeah, it goes. And now it instantly flags red and it's showing up that that test has failed. And if I fix it, assuming this thing doesn't crash, saved it, it's gonna recompile that specific DLL, they flipped to green. So this is the best. Um, if you're sitting there and you wanna just go into like, you know, the flow and, and just wanna code, don't have to worry about, you know, publish and stop and wait. Um, this is where the productivity increase of unit tests really shows up. Um, hopefully everybody has access to Enterprise Edition. I'm not even sure how much it costs anymore. It's a lot though. Um, but it really does help your developers or it helps me when I'm going through change, a bunch of changes and all the rest, I can immediately see and get that quick feedback that everything's working okay. And, and by the way, uh, live unit testing does work with any other test framework. You don't require to use MS test. It works with XUnit and all the rest. It's just, you just have to have um, you just have to have the, uh, the uh, Enterprise Edition. I didn't know that, that's cool. When, when, when did they add it to the Nota chant out of curiosity? A couple years? Oh, last year, okay. So he was just saying, if you're gonna hear, ReSharper has it available. There's no project that does exactly the same from I remember from five years ago. Really? It's not really well known, but I've seen it. Okay. So if you have ReSharper Ultimate, which a lot of people do nowadays, or, or whatever version of ReSharper, take a look at that as well. Oh, same feature. I wonder if it, it probably uses the same underlying framework, I would guess, to be honest. All right, so let's talk about the cool, the really, 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 really cool stuff. Auto fixture. Auto fixture was made by Mark Seaman. He's a Dutchman um, about, I don't know, four or five years ago, maybe a little bit more. What auto fixture is designed to do is get rid of um, test maintenance, right? So I'll show you what I mean by test maintenance. If I flip over here, one of the problems you have when setting up um, setting up these tests, and you see it all the time, is you get these really big, now I can't remember where I put them. Um, you get these really, really big um, assert blocks. Here they go, start looking like this. So, ah. Okay, so this is one of the problems you often see, um, and I can show you better examples. 
So your range blocks start getting really big, right? And that's only like 10 lines, but depending on the complexity of your test, I used to see 20 or 30 or 40 or even, or even larger. Um, that's a code smell, but it's also a, a fa uh, part of the fact that mocking parts of the library is really difficult. Like in this case, if you're gonna mock the old cell HTTP context, I gotta instantiate you know, a bunch of stuff, create it all and, and wire it all up. Um, you know, I, I've built services that might require five or six things that have to be injected and that requires quite a bit of, of mocking. So what auto fixture does, so this is what it looks like with manual, right? Auto fixture is a way of wiring all that stuff up using, um, using a auto mocking container. So fixture.create, you pass in your concrete class, it will automatically create a mock proxy of that and stub out all the properties and methods with fake data. So it instantly alleviates most, hopefully, of your setup, except for explicit things maybe you want to, uh, you want to create. So it, it removes all of, all of that, um, that nasty uh, setup type and, and, and really reduces the maintenance of your test because now if I start adding properties and that type of stuff to this carts, control, oops, to this carts controller, auto fixture will just automatically throw stuff in there. In addition to doing that stuff, it throws in random data. So for instance, if it sees a string property on your, on your POCO, it'll throw in a GUID and some random stuff. If it throws an integer, it'll throw in a random integer. Uh, if it sees an array, I think by default it creates three, but you can change that. Anyway, so it starts at up to three. It starts throwing all this random data in there. What I found that ha helps is a lot of times people code maybe not expecting certain cir circumstances or only for like one object in an array and not for zero objects or not for three. It, it starts helping prevent the brittle zero test. And you don't have to do, there's no maintenance on it. Auto fixture just randomly does it. So let me go ahead and start. So it's a, it's a test data container, right? <laughs> It's free, obviously. Um, so again, like I was showing you, it simplifies the arrange method, right? So in this case, I'm saying, uh, hey, auto fixture, create me a adder. Auto fixture, the adder has a couple of injected dependencies. Auto fixture automatically creates mocks of those and it set up stuff for me. Or say maybe, hey, auto fixture, I actually want to um, create me some integers as test data. So cool, you can pass in a value type, auto fixture will automatically randomize and create you integer test values. All those algorithms are controllable by you and you can override all of them as well. You can also plug in some really cool stuff like uh, FS check, which I think is a Haskell derived um, thing that lets you do like, you wanna make sure your methods can handle two billion what, minus one integers added to each other. It'll do that for you. I mean, you'd be surprised. Or you wanna make sure your arrays, what's the default array length? I think arrays can only technically be, again, 16 bits worth. You wanna make sure that they can actually handle that without your functions blowing up. Uh, that can do that for you as well. So the other part of auto fixture, the other real powerful is something called auto mock. So again, mocking is the, is the idea that we take an interface or an abstract class, okay? We take the interface and abstract class that we create to set all this stuff up and we let a proxy object be created on the fly and we tell it exactly what we want. So the, you know, a classic example of this is databases, right? I don't want a database running my local machine. The database is probably crappy probably requires a bunch of setup, the data is never right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or I don't want to run my build server and all the rest. So instead I abstract that database behind an interface or an abstract class of some kind. Then what I use is something like auto mock and auto fixture to say, actually give me a, when I run tests, an exact representation of that um, interface or that database with all this stuff stubbed out. And it will mock the methods to return exactly the data I want for running my test. So I remove all that hassle of having the database connection. Or, I mean, this is like universal. There's always one service run by somebody, some IT person who's been there for 75 years, and it takes 17 seconds to return data. Like, this. no, it's fine. This is how it worked in 1986. How's it going to work now? Um, and I don't want to rely on that guy too, right? So it's about abstracting that behind like an HTTP client and all the rest. And that lets you, this type of stuff lets you mock that. And with auto fixture, it auto mocks it. So here's what I mean by that. So this lets, um, lets us automatically create and automatically abstract um, interfaces. So if I take a look here, take a look at the real implementation of my products controller or my product service. This is what happens when you switch real quick. 
you can see I'm injecting in a database context. So what I would have to do normally is I'd have to create a mock of that database context, set it all up and, and, and handle it all um, manually in the assert phase. Instead with Automock, it just goes ahead and automatically will create this uh, proxy of this that lets me override specific things. So if I look at the implementation details, whenever it goes to it, there it goes. It automatically create me a, a fake DB set with a fake bunch of carts with random data populated in them and I don't have to do any setup for me. So it really, really handy for that type of stuff. All right, so here's the next one. Um, auto fixture then, say you, you do that, it's cool. Random data is great, but sometimes you wanna mock specific behavior, right? Say I wanna mock um, a service throwing an exception or a service returning me exact data, whatever. So what we use there is we use um, two different methods called freeze and inject that lets us override auto fixture and specify explicit behavior. So this is a really simple example. At the very top there, I'm telling auto fixture, when you create me this iCache mock, what I actually want you to do is return me, um, if somebody calls git for that specific type, return me a empty list, okay? So that second line there, so fixture freeze, iCache. I want you to set up so that when somebody calls me a git of products, and it could be any string, just return me an empty list. That lets me verify a specific behavior. I can also change, I can return a list of one object, a specific object, et cetera, et cetera. Or I can say, uh, get iList product, and instead of it, that is any string, maybe I'm expecting a specific query string, and I wanna return a specific thing. Let's you mock all that behavior up in like three lines. Um, or I wanna say auto fixture, whenever somebody returns, uh, asks for an int, return eight. I don't know why, eight's a cool number. So you set it up, and auto fixture from that point on will always return eight for that instance of the class. Really helps, again, for mocking um, specific behavior on objects without having to mock the entire object, right? Like, I, I feel like I've been in the industry too long. Like, how many people have databases that maybe have grown too big, right? Like 75 column, po like po or 75 property POCOs and all the rest. Like, this really alleviates that concern. You don't have to mock all those objects. You just uh, let it toss in data as much as you want and then mock the very specific properties you care about. Uh, idioms, another awesome part of it. This is an add-on package for AutoFixture. Uh, we have available with the new, uh, new Git. So what AutoFixture auto idioms are is it lets you test really you know, basic stuff. Like oftentimes, I, all my methods and classes have guard clauses, right? Make sure nobody tries to pass in a null when, when they shouldn't be. We're not Kotlin. We don't yet, although it's coming, have uh, automatic no nulls. Um, what these idioms let me do is actually auto fixture automatically test those and take care of those for me. Just make sure that for my um, my default commerce server right there, I want you to make sure every single, um, if I pass in a null in any of the constructor parameters, it throws a non or a argument not null exception. And that does that for you. So that can eliminate quite a bit of code. Um, it'll do that also as well for any any arbitrary method, right? If you have any arbitrary methods that's not expecting nulls, when you try to pass it in, it'll throw exceptions there. Uh, that one right there, the one on the right is one of those dumb ones that's handy. Uh, it's called writable property or uh, verify your properties are wired up correctly. Like when, when I first saw this, I'm like, oh, come on, who screws up properties? Two days later, I, I screwed up my property. Um, so what this lets you do is it all does it quickly, make sure, give it a random class. It writes the property, make sure it returns correctly. That's it, right? Very basic, but it's two lines of code and make sure that nobody does a dumb typo puts the wrong thing or, or does something silly for an object. It also lets you do read only and all the rest. It will handle all that stuff for you. It's great. Um, and last, customize. So, or not second to last, customize for AutoFixture. So this lets us customize the object creation of AutoFixture. So I have this cart and AutoFixture, I want you to customize the your creation algorithm for cart. So every time I call and ask you for a, for a cart, what I want you to do is set me to purchase flag to false, set the same GUID and set the last modified time to whatever date time max value is. Um, auto fixture will then automatically create that exact cart every single time for you. That lets you control at a way more um, in depth level, the exact creation of an object. Um, think about most handily, I, I think mostly for large DB sets. I want to mock specific behavior on them. Auto fixture create, uh, customizations are, are the last part of auto fixture. So the one on the left is 
Again, the old parts of the framework, using .NET Core is way easier nowadays. The old parts of the framework had a whole lot of really complex object graphs that became very difficult to mock. Um, so on the left, it's showing you how to actually customize so that when something requests uh, HTTP configuration or HTTP request message method, it won't just throw exceptions. Um, the reason being, on the HTTP request method there on the left, uh, Microsoft decided to violate one of the solid principles and they one of their um, abstractions throws a not implemented exception. So you actually, if you try to create that automatically, it'll reflect on the method and blow itself up. So instead, we go ahead and just fine, we'll create HTTP connection and we'll mock it out. But that way I don't have to do it in every single one of my tests. These behaviors can be set up once, injected in auto fixture, and you don't have to care about them ever again. Again, I'm lazy, I'm a programmer. I don't wanna do that every time. Auto fixture lets me take care of that. Uh, all you do is then when you create your auto fixture and you set up your tests there on the right hand side, you just pass in the um, customizations right there. All right, we're talking about mocks. Let's dig into mocks a little bit more. Uh, again, we're using mock four. Um, it's an open source library. Like we saw before on the left hand side, instead of all that stuff there, it just lets us automatically create um, mock objects on the fly when the test is run. In general, if you use interfaces, it should take care of pretty much all your needs uh, or abstract based classes if you want to. So on the left, you'll see, hey, that's where I have to, to create my default commerce service. If I wasn't as manually, I'd have to create commerce database contacts. I'd have to instantiate the endpoint them or my logger, I gotta pass in a root logger and a log net factory and all the rest. Instead, mock just automatically handles all that for you. Just takes the interface, run reflection on it, creates dummy proxy methods, and you can wire them up exactly how you want. Then, say for a mock, I my mean, iCache that we saw before, uh, mock, I want you to say, whenever anything this test is calling exists with any string, just return true, right? I don't know why, but maybe that's a part of my test. Or maybe on the next one down there, um, out of fixture, or when you're creating this iCommerce service, I want to make sure that if the product ID is equal to three and the, it's any GUID, just throw an exception. So maybe I'm, I'm testing to make sure that if product ID is three, it throws an exception. That's just my test, right? It's a pretty valid use case. Um, but that saves you hundreds of lines of code or dozens of lines of code, depending on how complex your stuff is. So yeah, it.is and it.is any, again, they're just built-in methods of mock um, that lets you handle all those type of specific use case behavior. I'll be honest, the syntax can get a little confusing. It took me a little bit to figure it out, especially when you're nesting in like four nested lambdas and anonymous functions. But uh, once you get the hang of it, it is super powerful. So protected members. Um, there's a couple of these on the .NET framework. Um, HP message handler, if you're writing web APIs um, before, core, actually until core, I think one one. To mock them out, it's a, Protected members normally mock can't handle. Here's the runs reflection. Reflection only by default specifies the public methods. So if you need to mock a protected member, which you do have to on occasion, what you can do is you can use a protected keyword. Um, what this does is it tells mock to uh, run reflection using protection and then attempt to instantiate a method based on that string you send in. So that's why it says there's a warning up there. There's no intelligence on this at runtime or when the test runs, mock is gonna try to instantiate that class and just try to see if that, um, that method called send async exists. And if it does, you'll go ahead and it'll create it and it'll mock the specific behavior I want. In this case, I'm trying to say, hey, actually um, for this HP message handler, go ahead and always return HP status okay. All right, verify. So again, oftentimes happen, maybe you don't care what the result of a behavior is, Maybe all you want to do is make sure a service gets called. In that case, you can use verify um, to make sure that specific members of your fixture get called. So in this case, on the left-hand side, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, auto fixture, just verify that um, service got called or the, the get method got called once. That's it. Just that's what that times, I don't move out of the camera range, bottom left, that time once, that's all that means. Just make sure that that, that specific method got called and then get, you can return with any GUID that gets called once. You can also, there's also times never, so you make sure maybe a method never gets called. There's also like time specifics, maybe you want something to be called five times and only five times, but it's various ways of verifying a method can only be called. Um, again, it just lets you shim all the behavior you don't necessarily have to care about, you just wanna make sure the service gets called. 
very handily, especially for HTTP APIs. In this case, this is a, uh, yeah, like a commerce service or a database or something like that. DB set. Supposedly this is fixing EF core. I was actually playing around with it last night. It is, but EF core is, I'm not a Microsoft employee, I don't care. EF core is still garbage. Sorry if there's any, any framework people in here. It's missing a lot of feature sets. Um, it is fixing EF core, but if you're still on any framework, for some reason they made DB set really, really difficult to mock. So this is stolen from a Stack Overflow post, which properly attributed, which I later found out somebody actually has now made a NuGet package, which implements this for you. So you can just add it. So thanks to that person. But uh, if you're using any framework or any of the ORMs that's relying on DB set, here is the exact way to mock a, um, a properly DB set so that you can set up your ND framework database context to return any arbitrary thing. Uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to, which is delightfully fun. Um, trying to figure it out on my own, it took me like about two hours, maybe two and a half, and then I started, I Googled for it. I was like, oh, somebody did this, but uh, not, not any fun. But this, if you use mock to do it, then you set up an auto fixture customization, I'll take care of for you. You never have to worry about it ever again. And again, now there's a NuGet package for it, for it, for auto fixture that I'm going to take care of it. Um, HTTP context. Uh, so, you know, here's some random general tips. Again, a lot of web VI development I do, obviously. Um, in .NET Core, it's taken care of for you because HTTP context is no longer a static class. It is an abstract class. Microsoft themselves took care of this. But if, again, if you're using it, yes, five minutes. If you're using a older version of it, it um, you need to make sure you always rely on HTTP context base. The bottom there, I'm showing some, that's Castle Windsor. It's a dependency injection framework I prefer. But the general idea is a lot of times I'd see in people's code, they'll do HTTP context.current in some random controller to grab like the session or the request or something like that. That is impossible to mock, very nearly impossible to mock. Instead, the suggested way you do it is you inject HTTP context base into your controller and set it up through your dependency injection. The, the bottom there is how to do it for Castle Windsor, although Ninject and all the rest have very similar ways of handling it. Um, again, to mock HTTP client calls, we're running low on time, but the slides are available. It's, there's a very specific way to do it. So you can use um, a factory method and a client handler is a preferred method of the Microsoft did finally fix this as well in Dynacore, Core, so thank you, Microsoft. In summary, the coolest things I can tell you, the one I really want you to remember, besides if you have additional questions, you know, always pull up the slides of the project, use dependency injection, it'll make your life way easier. Always rely on abstractions, use auto fixture, use mocks, and static classes are, um, it says bad, they're the worst. Static classes are the worst. If you ever have to, out of have you ever had to do a shim or a fake to try to mock a stack, a static class? Yeah, I think so. It, it, I tried for like two days one time, I wasn't able to get to work. And then I tried again following like Scott Hanselman's or one of the Scott's things, and it took me a day and I finally got to work for a test project. It's not any fun. Uh, here's a list of resources um, on various parts of this. If you wanna go more in depth in there, the auto fixture cheat sheet isn't particularly handy. Um, Mark Seaman also has a great series of posts on auto fixture, various use cases if you have questions on it. It's really, it was really my guide. Um, and then there's some nice stuff uh, on solid principles you can pull from old versions of TechNet or TechEd that are perfectly still relevant and available. And as well as some introduction to unit testing. If you're still, still the topic is a little bit too uh, far uh, advanced for you, you need a more, more basics level. I'll leave that up. Um, but are there any questions? I think we have like three minutes. Sorry. And we can get you guys going to the awesome, fun closing thing. And then home on this lovely Friday. No, Thursday, whatever day it is. Well, um, I want I agree with you except for one thing. Uh, that's static that's class, pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> static classes are not really always bad. If you have pure methods, you don't need to mock anything, and you can test it as it is. That's it's a very good point. If you're using yeah. if you're functionally pure, where they take in and, and don't modify our change of state, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. That's a huge pass. I should I should have thrown it. <laughs> uh, what about uh, asynchronous methods in entity framework? Uh, now, uh, for me, what that was a pain to mock uh, asynchronous actions to the database. So th that's why I can flip back and come back after the topic. Um, that's why mock and auto fixture should take care of those because you're just 
there's a stub part of auto fixture you can install called I think auto fixture async that'll take care of a lot of the wiring up and then it's just like mock anything else just mock dot save async and it'll wire up all the async behind the scenes for you and you just mock it up like you normally would so auto fixture plus mock if you come down I can show you the package yep thank you I know I, I feel like auto the, the community behind auto fixture is great. I would highly encourage everybody to contribute to it, but it takes care of a lot of these really hard use cases like async actions to databases, which are a pain in the butt to mock. I, that was for entity framework, not entity framework core. I don't know if it works for core, by the way. Anybody else? Oh, I got one. I mean, I, I could just throw the headset at you. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a question that I've begs to, in my mind to be said, um, let's assume that we have a pretty large project with, let's say, 5,000 tests okay. and lots of, lots of components. Mm -hmm. Now, sooner or later, we'll, we'll, there will be a point when you have so much mocks for each component then each small change would trigger lots of uh, code maintenance and updates and stuff like that. So what would be the best uh, way to deal with such complexity when we are talking about mocking and unit test best practices? Yeah, so the, the, the one real life example I have is I have a project with 4,300 unit tests, right? So it's getting pretty close to that scale. Um, the biggest thing that's helped in there was two things, auto fixture being the, the one that really, really helped. We only mocked the exact behavior we cared about so if there was minor changes, we didn't have to worry about, you know, changing all those mocks. Um, the other thing we did is for more complex types, a, a, my coworker, Ben, he implemented a custom um, factory that read off a JSON property. And we use that for all these random things. So if there was a common property we knew would be changing, we'd update the JSON file and then it'd create like proxy objects for us. That's getting pretty advanced. Uh, I think for the most part, best practice are use auto fixtures. Um, I'm sorry, use auto fixture, use mocks, and hopefully only rely on the properties you care about, right? Don't code in your test, you're checking every single property, because then if you change one, you're gonna have to change the test data for all of them. And again, try to rely on test data, try to rely on the behavior, right? So rely on behaviors rather than tests. Um, there's some examples on the code where I'm, auto fixture is creating two integers, I'm passing them in class, and I know what the result should be, and I'm just verifying it instead of verifying the data itself. No more questions? Please rate, by the way. Oh, sorry. Well, regardless, watch walks there. Please rate all the speakers, by the way, even if it's bad. Uh, feedback is great for everybody. Uh, actually, we use auto fixture in our project, and we have sometimes problem uh, that test breaks because of randomness, uh, like. Uh, uh, 99 uh, times out of 100 works. Yeah, and the 100 times breaks. Uh, breaks. The, the uh, only time I've seen that is an array, if somebody had coded in a specific check and it was breaking out of bounds. So because array is random data, you're getting some random data and somebody didn't code for a specific exception. Yeah. Personally, when I had this problem, yeah. I, I split the test into two. And because, it works? Uh, yeah, into, because actually uh, this one case when it broke, it's actually was edge case, so. Yeah, right, it was yeah, good, yeah. That's, it's, that's awesome. Yeah, it was just a random edge case that happened to be yeah, triggering. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's another I guess, great example why you use auto fixture, right? Something you wouldn't have caught in a normal test, you run auto fixture, it's catching the edge test and you're able to verify it. Who knows what actually ever happened to prod, but still lets you test for it. It always happens in prod, what am I kidding? <laughs> it stuff only breaks in prod. Other part of my job where I get, I'm getting white hair is troubleshooting prod issues. Anything else, everybody? 